Welcome to Dangerous Gifts. Um, I'm Mona Atea. I'm the director of the Institute for Middle East Studies here at the George Washington University. And we are really excited to um, be in conversation with Ozan Ozafi from uh, Utrecht University. He's assistant professor of trans-imperial history. And we'll be discussing his new monograph today, Dangerous Gifts, Imperialism, Security, and Civil Wars in the Levant from 1798 to 1864, um, where he analyzes the genealogy of Western armed interventionism in the Ottoman Levant. Um, he is currently writing his third monograph, provisionally titled The Invention of the Eastern Question, International Law, Capitulations and Security in the Embassies of Sir Robert Liston, uh, which is under contract. And in his first monograph, he investigated the idea of liberty in the Middle East and the caucus, which resulted in the publication of his first book, Intellectual Origins of the Republic. Um, he's also co-leading the Lausanne Project and the Security History Network. Um, thank you, Ozan, so much for joining us today. Uh, he'll be in conversation with uh, Dr. Amy Gunnell, who's assistant professor of Islamic world history at the University of West Georgia. She's a historian of the late Ottoman Empire and its relationship with Europe. And she works on digital humanities and bringing new perspectives to the history of international relations and international law. She's also expecting a monograph um, with Columbia University Press to be out shortly, Empires by Law, the Ottoman Origins of the Mandate System in the Middle East, which traces Ottoman roots of the post-imperial political order through analysis of the inter-imperial contest over autonomous Egypt. Um, and she's working on a second research project on Istanbul under allied military occupation. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today to both of you. Um, just before I pass the floor over to Amy. I want to thank um, Christian Clinton, uh, who's our program manager here at the Institute, um, for taking care of all the logistics and Maram, um, the assistant, events assistant, for stepping in and helping out with um, all of those logistics. And I also just want to tell you that um, Amy and Ozan will be in conversation for about 45 minutes and then we'll have time for audience questions. So you can feel th free to throw those in the chat as you as they come up, but we won't touch them until the end. And um, without further ado, Amy, uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I was really thrilled to be invited because I'm already a massive fan of Ozan's uh, articles as well as his books. And I enjoy the opportunity to reread the book again. It's an important text and I'm excited to talk about it today. So what I thought I would do is just start off by saying that this book really offers something very exciting and innovative to an old question, um, the, the, the Eastern question, um, and, and more broadly, a new approach to Ottoman entanglements with Europe during a very critical period from the late 18th century until the 1860s, which from an Ottoman historiographical perspective, we still have relatively few archivally grounded studies, especially for the earlier part of the period. So this is, is very new and very exciting. And the book makes several, I think, important contributions to how we can rethink the Ottoman-European relationship. So instead of focusing on the end point in the world in which we live that was wrought out of the destruction of the empire at the end of the First World War, Ozan starts with the beginning of the story in the late 18th century when entering the game of European politics was no longer really a choice of at the Ottoman imperial center. So one of the most important contributions that I see, and you'll see that many of my questions are structured around this issue, is that the Ottoman empire appears um, not only alive, but somewhat well, even though it was deeply constrained by Europe and more so as we go through the book, but critically, the Ottomans appear as one of the critical or important players in European politics that really mattered. So I was hoping you might start by telling us a bit about how your approach, which foregrounds the experience of Ottoman bureaucrats and local subjects, changes how we understand the old Eastern question literature in general. And I thought maybe you could just start with your title, because I always love how authors come up with their titles. And I wanted to know, what are the dangerous gifts on, off, uh, on offer? And what were some of the main conundrums that you kind of wrestled with as you wrote this book? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Amy, for, for this great question, also for your comment uh, on the book. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to you that you made the time to join us today and read the book again, possibly, and also to, to the organizers of this event, uh, to Mona, Shana, and uh, Christian. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to answer your question, um, that's a great question. Maybe I should begin with the title. So Dangerous Gifts is a late, I would say a very late intervention to a public debate that took place, a hidden public debate that took place in the early 2000s in the run up to the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. Back then, we had this discussion between uh, prominent experts of the Middle East like Fuad Ajami, who was reportedly an advisor of the neoconservatives in Washington, DC. And he was pro-war, an exponent of the war. And he would argue that, perhaps in line with the budding literature of the time on the benevolent aspects of empire, Ajami would argue that the American invasion of Iraq was an imperial burden. Its ultimate aim should not simply be ending the despotic regime of Saddam Hussein, but also modernizing the Arab world, improving the Middle East, what have you. And only time will tell, he would argue, whether this will be, the invasion would be a noble success or a noble failure, but whatever it was, it would be a noble imperial attempt. And he would write this second exposition in his 2006 book titled Foreigner's Gift. On the other side of the hidden dialogue, you would find figures like none other than the Palestinian literary critic Edward Said. He would have this critical take on the works of David Armitage, now Ferguson, who were actually arguing that the imperial system in the Middle East wasn't too bad in the end, or all rest of the colonial or, or, or colonized world. And he would say that all empires have to this date argued that their aim is to liberate and educate people in the regions that they conducted where they state interventions. But you would find in the end that these interventions would result in further turmoil and um, catastrophes in certain cases. But Said would candidly also remark that he was only being impressionistic. And he, his take was in certain respects problematic, which I believe we might like to revisit eventually. And reading the dialogue as an undergraduate student back then grew in me the question of how this all began. How did the foreign interventions in the wider Middle East begin? And what their repercussions were like? And in 2014, I was invited to Utrecht to write a book about the 1860 civil war in Syria and foreign interventions in it. And thinking that intervention in 1860 in relation to what happened in early 2000s, led me to write eventually a more genealogical analysis of foreign armed interventions, Western foreign armed interventions in the wider Middle East, or though the book regionally focuses on a region which I call the Levant, meaning the coasts of Eastern Mediterranean from Alexandria to Greece. Uh, to go back to your question, why dangerous gifts? The ultimate argument of the book is that however goodwilled these interventions might have been in the past, their repercussions tended to, tended to be detrimental. They tended to bring about further turmoil, which is in line with what Edward Said is arguing to an extent. But now I'm going to come to your first question. What about the Eastern question and the agency of the local actors, Ottoman Imperial, agents and subjects, citizens, if you like. This has been the missing link for quite some time in the literature of the Eastern question. 
So we have really rich literature on Eastern question, which we might roughly define as have to deal with the alleged weakness of the Ottoman Empire. But this literature usually focused on how the European actors or later Western actors like the United States dealt with the alleged weakness of the Ottoman Empire, how they piloted Ottoman reforms, how they competed with each other to ensure the maintenance of the Ottoman Empire or to um, nibble around the edges of the Ottoman Empire, establish a variety of administrative structures, sometimes through annexations, sometimes through establishing informal imperial uh, uh, mechanism, imperialist mechanisms. So there was this collaboration competition mechanism or history that focused on European imperial agents and much less so the Ottoman imperial agents and subjects. So the book tells the story of foreign armed interventionism, not only from the perspective of why interventions took place, but also asking a second question. How were the interventions received by the so-called native actors, be it Ottoman imperial agents or the local subjects? So I looked at how the Ottoman agents experienced the Eastern question and how it uh, resulted in, I call it in the book, an ontological insecurity, but I could just as well call it uh, a syndrome on the part of Ottoman agents for nearly 150 years until the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. And their manifold responses to the Eastern question, both imperial agents and Ottoman subjects, shows us at least two things. One of them is that foreign interventions had quite remarkable pull factors. Their interventions were not necessarily, they did not necessarily originate in Europe or somewhere in the West, but more often than not, you would find an Ottoman agent or a Druze feudal lord or a Maronite clergy asking for foreign powers to intervene and even creating or writing down these concrete schemes of how to intervene, how the European powers should intervene. That's number one. And the second take or the finding of the book, I would say, is that the interventions did not necessarily create further turmoil and catastrophes in the in the Middle East from scratch, but they usually made existing problems, be it sectarian differences or class conflicts or inter pasha rivalries in the Ottoman world, more complex and and, 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 and brought this violent vortex uh, to a, 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 perhaps a much more difficult level of complexity to, to resolve. So that's basically the book is about and why the agency of local actors matter in the Eastern question. Excellent, thank you. I think that that's a good overview um, of the book. So I hope that I can maybe dig deeper into some of the particular episodes. What, one of the big surprises for me when I read this book was actually the story about the Congress of Vienna in 1815 after the catastrophe of the Napoleonic Wars and all of this kind of experimentation with, with constitutions. And well before the Congress, you note know that advisors to Sultan Selim III, um, you know that one advisor talks about politics and tries to explain what politics or politica meant. And he says, quote, a European term that in our times means to act with trickery or deceit. And I, I mean, I love this. Who wouldn't love this? And I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about Ottoman views of Europe from the beginning of your story and also at the period around the Congress of Vienna in 1815. Because I think so often if we just read the European literature, we don't get the sense of how activist the Ottoman state was around the question of Vienna and whether or not to participate in Europe or to try to sit out of participating in Europe. So um, I wondered perhaps too, if you could tell us about some of the, the consequences of refusing to participate in Vienna. Yes, sure, another great question. 
from an Ottoman perspective, in the long 18th century, from the 1680s three until 1810s, the major rival were the Romanovs, the Russians. The Ottomans and the Russians fought a number of wars in, in, in the 18th century, and only once could the Ottomans emerge victorious in these wars. And especially in the 1768-1774 war that ended with the uh, Treaty of Kuchukainaja, the terms of the treaty were so harsh and the fact that the Russians now had a toehold in the Black Sea and could bring about 30,000 men to Istanbul and end the Ottoman Empire within 48 hours before the news reached to the nearest major imperial capital in Europe, created this huge turmoil in European diplomacy and as well as this huge ontological insecurity syndrome on the part of the Ottomans. Even though throughout the 18th century, the Ottomans' relations with Russians were more or less stable in eternal antagonism, their relations with other powers, especially with France, was a bit less, or a bit more ambiguous, I would say, because especially when Céline de Tert ascended to the throne in 1789, what he thought and hoped to do was to go into an alliance with France and finally upend the misfortunes of his empire by becoming an active actor in the European system, the unfolding European system, by forging alliances with, with this Catholic power, the French, as well as the Swedish and possibly the Prussians. That was his goal. 1789. But then nine years later, something quite extraordinary happened for Selim, though it wasn't quite unexpected, as I tell in the book. Uh, I disagree with some of the literature there. But in 1798, the French invaded Egypt. And Selim III burst into anger in Topkapi Palace. And even more interesting to me is he found himself in an alliance with Britain and Russia, fighting against the French, though he was thinking of the exact opposite scenario. In 1799, you would find these Russian squadrons passing through Istanbul for the first time in history. The Ottoman imperial capital would see the navy of its arch enemy, the Russians, pass through the Bosphorus and imagine the excitement on the one hand, but at the same time, confusion it created on the part of the local population. But the Napoleonic Wars were a period of uh, fickle alliances, uh, fluid relations. Also in Europe, you would find Britain and uh, Austria in alliance with Russians in, 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 at one stage, and then they would turn into, you know, these enemies all of a sudden, you know, the, 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 the relations were, revolving all the time within Europe. And it was a bewildering experience for the Ottomans all along. In 1801, just after the French were driven out of Egypt with the help of British forces, what happened was the Ottomans found themselves looking to obtain the support of the French to drive the occupying British forces out of Egypt, because according to the 1802 agreement, the British forces were supposed to leave Egypt within 10 months or so, but the British wouldn't do that. They wanted to ensure a system in Egypt first that would prevent the return of the French, but the Ottomans were quite uh, uncomfortable with this. In fact, Selim III never liked the idea of British forces landing in Egypt to help the Ottoman army to, to fight against the French, but then it became evident that he wouldn't be able to drive the French out himself. But then he found himself having to obtain French support, diplomatic support to drive the British out, which they eventually did, but not without establishing a secure position to their Mamluk base in Egypt. And not, uh, you know, that, that this resulted, I would say, 
a civil war eventually between the Mamluks, Ottoman Imperial actors and uh, the agents and, and Albanian regiments that split from the Ottoman army as I discuss in the third chapter of the book. So what I'm trying to say is the Ottoman agents were bewildered with what was happening with all these fickle alliances. And when we reached 1814, when the Congress of Vienna began, as the powers, they did not exclude the Ottoman Empire, the European powers, the great powers as they styled themselves in 1814. In fact, they wanted to involve the Ottoman Empire, its European dominions, in the final act of the Congress of Vienna. With that act, they wanted to secure the territorial integrity of the European dominions of the Sultan, but the Ottoman agents rejected it. And especially the agency of Halet Efendi, who was one of the most influential figures in the Ottoman imperial court at the time, uh, deserves uh, a certain attention here. And that's what I try to do in the fourth chapter of the book. He was Ottoman ambassador in Paris in the 1800s, and he would receive Napoleon's, Napoleon Bonaparte's threats. Uh, at that time, Bonaparte was threatening the Ottoman uh, court uh, to become an ally of France in the war against Russia and Britain. And Selim would did it. He would for, first uh, sign an alliance agreement with Russia in 1806, but then he would revert his position after seeing French victories. Uh, so Selim was also pragmatic. Selim III, one would say the pragmatism was not a, you know, a, a European thing alone. Uh, but Halad Efendi, having experienced these threats and having seen that the, the, the Russians might have ulterior motives in including the Ottoman Empire in the so-called Vienna system, would pressure the Sultan not to sign or not to be, not to involve in, 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 in this final act, not to agree on this. The Ottomans didn't even send an agent other than, you know, a second tier diplomat called Mayanko Mavriani even though the European powers would want a, a more senior Ottoman minister to be present in Vienna. So in the end, they decided not to be part of the Vienna order in the uh, nascent years of that new world order, mainly because of their distrust to European international law, European public law, and the great powers. So the story is very complex. Uh, I try to explain it in the book, but uh, to my surprise, until Dangerous Gifts, and I recently published another article, the position of the Ottoman Empire during the Congress of Vienna was never studied. So uh, I find it very, very surprising to, to perfect notice because it's one of the key moments of also the Eastern question because the term was actually possibly coined for the first time then in the 1810s rather than in 1821, when the powers in Vienna were discussing the Northern question, which was the issue of what would happen to Scandinavian countries, the Western question, which was uh, focused on the, the Latin American countries, and Eastern question, it, was, it had two tiers, the, the Polish issue on the one hand, and what would happen to the European territories of the Ottoman Empire. So, um, so that, that's, that's uh, yeah, that was quite surprising, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, I, I found that part of the book utterly stunning and was also sort of shocked to realize that this isn't something that we know a lot about, I mean, especially because there has been so much more work recently on sort of Ottoman interest in international law. So it's, it was really an exciting, for me, part of the book. I, I mean, I have so many questions that spin off of your, your answer, but I guess I, I thought it would be good for you to perhaps have an opportunity to talk about more of these local rivalries because you retell the history of the Eastern question, not only through Ottoman imperial actors in Istanbul, but also these, these rivalries amongst officials in the provinces, as well as you know, provincial magnates in the provinces and just different groups, um, and also through different local political interests and constellations and you know, uh, local, local conflict. Um, so you direct our attention towards the local and the way in which the local shape broader imperial as well as international politics. And so you talk a lot about rivalries and you mentioned just now the fight between Halet Effendi um, 
and Mehmet Ali Pasha, later Husrev Pasha and Mehmet Ali figures prominently in this book. But what struck me is that these fights actually really matter. Like they determine political outcomes on the ground that are gonna have lasting consequences for the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. So that was also surprising that we don't see this Ottoman Empire that's like, you know, on the ground and is being picked at by the Europeans, but instead it's actually these, there are these local dynamics that really, really matter in terms of shaping outcomes. Um, so I guess, um, I, I don't know, I guess I wondered if you, I don't know if you want to pick a particular episode, but if you could just talk about the way in which both imperial rivalries amongst officials and local dynamics shaped broader, the broader international story and changes how we think of it. Yeah, this is this is also a great question. I think the local inter Pasha, I would say, rivalry that I find most fascinating is the one between the Pasha of Egypt, Mehmet Ali, and Husre Pasha, who was Seraskar or later Minister of War. He, he also became Grand Vizier in 1839. Their story is fascinating because these two figures go to Egypt in 1800 with the Ottoman Imperial Army. One of them is Kahya, a steward of the, the Grand Admiral of the Ottoman Empire, Husrev, who was originally a Caucasian slave, brought to Istanbul in 1770s as a very young child and then brought up in the, the Topkapı Palace and as part of this Gulam system, you know, the slave turned into one of the leading figures of the empire, Husrev. And the other one who also arrived in Egypt in the year 1800, Mehmed Ali, was a gangster in, in uh, Kavala in uh, modern day Greece. Uh, he's Albanian, but uh, possibly with some Kurdish uh, origins that is disputed, I was told. Uh, but I haven't done a genealogical uh, analysis of where Mehmed Ali actually came from. Khaled Fahmi is uh, the person to ask about his origins. And the story of Mehmet Ali and Husserv is super exciting because one year after the French evacuate Egypt, a civil war begins and Husserv representing the Ottoman Empire as the new governor of Cairo and Mehmet Ali, uh, the, one of the commanders of the Albanian regiments which split from Husserv's army, they plunge into a civil war, and after three years, Husrev is forced out of Egypt. He returns back to the Ottoman Imperial capital. In fact, he first goes to Rhodos and then to the Balkans to, to a new position. And Mehmet Ali becomes the governor of Egypt in 1805. And the two, they leave in bad terms. They say goodbye to each other in bad terms in 1805. Because Mehmet Ali makes Husserv believe that he was actually working for Husserv eventually, even after the civil war, but then Husserv feels deceived. And then two decades later, Husserv became, became, became uh, the Grand Admiral of the Ottoman Empire during the Greek Revolution. And Husserv and Mehmet Ali found themselves having to fought against the Greeks together. Though the two figures hated each other, but they were acting as the Ottoman front. Mehmet Ali's uh, son, Ibrahim, was sent to Egypt to, to uh, deal with the, uh, sent to Greece to deal with the Greek revolutionaries on the ground. And Husserv was supporting Mehmet Ali from the sea as the, as the Grand Admiral. And at some point, Husserv would come back to Alexandria to bring supplies to Ibrahim. And 21 years, is it? It's 21 years after Husserv left Egypt for the first time, feeling deceived by Mehmet Ali. He would come back to the very same place to meet Mehmet Ali, to get supplies for Mehmet Ali's son. And a very interesting dialogue takes place between the two uh, that I try to uh, portray in the book. Husserv is so afraid in the beginning, he doesn't even leave his ship for 10 days before Mehmet Ali returns back from a trip to Candia, I believe. And then Mehmet Ali arrives to, to pretend to be in great terms. They just kiss each other, say each other, you're my brother. We had great times here as if, as if they didn't have this huge fight with one another. And then uh, they just uh, exchange these pleasantries. They give first one or two meetings, but then one week later, the, the real dynamic surface and their uh, old animosity um, 
informs the relationship between the two Pashas. And when Husrev, uh, at one of the sittings with Mehmet Ali, when he hears Mehmet Ali's complaints about how little Ibrahim is receiving support from the sea, how the Grand Admiral is not acting brave enough in the fight against the Greeks, which is true, in fact, the Grand Admiral was too conservative in the fight, Husrev feels humiliated. And when he leaves, the relationship between Egypt, Istanbul and Cairo and between Husrev and Ibrahim, Mehmed Ali's son, turn very sour immediately. And then Mehmed Ali asks Husrev's uh, dismissal from his position as the fighting against the Greeks continue. And Husrev is dismissed at Mehmed Ali's suggestion. But Husrev is such a uh, such a favorite figure of Sultan Mahmoud II that he dismisses Husrev from the Greek campaign but makes him minister of war, which antagonizes Mehmet Ali. And then three years later, we would find Husrev's son, Rishid. In fact, he was Husrev's slave, but Husrev calls his slave son. And Mehmet Ali's son, Ibrahim, would find themselves in the plateau of Konya, fighting against one another. As Husrev was minister of war in Istanbul and Mehmet Ali was Pasha of Cairo, he would start his Syrian campaign and go all the way up to Kutaya toward to eight hours away from Istanbul. So the two figures would come to a loggerhead. So, so wanted to suppress Mehmet Ali as a revenge to what happened in 1827 during the Greek campaign, but Husrev's armies were defeated. His son Rishid was uh, captured as a, a prisoner at the end of that war in 1832, sorry, not 1831, December 32 in Konya. And then seven years later, Husserl becomes Grand Vizier, and when the powers, the great powers, uh, four of them, in fact, Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, finally agree on supporting the Ottoman Empire against the French-backed Mehmet Ali. Mehmet Ali writes this letter to Husserl in 1839, August, I believe, and says, look, we have been fighting against each other all this time. We have this hostility for 38 years. But, you know, they are Europeans. They are the world of Christendom. We are Muslims. We shouldn't really let the Christians involve in our affairs, even though we hated each other, so we can resolve our problems. But then Husserl writes this letter back to him. I can't remember it word by word, but it's in chapter 7. And he says... Uh, well, what were you expecting me to do? Like uh, not to accept the, 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 the support that the great powers are offering to us. He writes that first and then he crosses those words. And then instead he writes, I'm waiting for you with perfect security. Just come and take your revenge. Like I'm not afraid of you, he, he replies. And then, uh, yeah, and then Mehmet Ali is eventually ousted from Syria, but not before getting Husrev dismissed from his position one more time, even though he, he was the, you know, he didn't have the upper hand in 1839-40. And this story goes, and not only in 1841, when Husrev was dismissed from position and Mehmet Ali's Syrian campaign ended, but continues after, because during the fighting, both Husrev and Mehmet Ali, they fund and they, they make pledges to Lebanese actors, the Druze and the Maronai separately, and their political ambitions also influenced local dynamics in Lebanon and for a series of civil wars to erupt in Lebanon from 1841 onwards. So you say Mehmet Ali's story doesn't end with 1841. In fact, uh, it, in fact uh, it, it goes all the way uh, up to 1864, I would say, even though both men, Mehmet Ali died in 1848 and if I'm not mistaken, Husrev died in 1855. So they didn't see what happened after to all these Apollo policies and how the rivalries, repercussions um, created further uh, violence in, in the Middle East. So this is one of the many. There are, there are quite a few others, and not only among Ottoman Pashas, of course, in Russia, in St. Petersburg, you would have this German camp, the pro-European camp, and the Russian camp, uh, the, the more nationalist hardliners, in Britain, you would have, of course, the well-known Whigs and Tories with different positions in France. So I try to draw attention also to the, the rivalries or political camps in, in other European capitals as well, but of course not to the same level of detail as I did with the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, I mean, it really, it really was spectacular because it also sort of made the Ottoman Empire just seem more like, I don't know, any other state, which we also often don't see in the 19th century. So I really appreciated that.
Um, and I guess that leads me to my next question, which is really one about Ottoman agency and its limits, because I do think, you know, even if you don't say it explicitly, that certainly Ottomans have far more agency in this story than any other book I've read on the Eastern question that I can think of. And, you know, this book draws upon Ottoman archival sources. It brings Ottoman archival sources into a story that has largely been told through European foreign ministries. Um, and in your telling of the story, you know, just in the, 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 the Pasha rivalry you just told us even, mm -hmm. Um, you know, the Ottoman state just seems so much more purposeful and its actions much more activist. I mean, it, you know, suffers from the same problems that any state in the early to mid 19th century would have had. But we also know that this is an empire that by the you know 1830s is going to be increasingly constrained by various European limitations on the exercise of sovereignty, probably most importantly, the capitulations, but, um, you know, other limitations as well. So I guess I was just wondering if you, you could just reflect a bit about Ottoman agency and its limits for the duration of your story. I'm not sure about what you mean by its limits, um, but I think we really need to take into account uh, how, for example, Ottoman agents experienced a revolution in 1820s in Greece while telling the story of why the 1827 Navarino intervention took place where dozens of European and thousands of Ottoman sailors died. Until now, the story is told mainly, as you said, from the perspective of European agents, and the narrative goes like this. The Greeks, rose in 1820, 21, and they started killing Muslims and Jews in different uh, villages and the provinces of Greece. And the Greeks had this ultimate aim of independence and freedom and liberation from the despotic rule of the Ottomans. In fact, the second part is very correct. They did really go for their liberation and there was a despotic rule of the Ottomans, a violently despotic rule. And then the powers, European powers intervened when the Ottomans responded to the Greek revolution very violently, which they did, that resulted in massacres to borrow of this 19th century term, where thousands of Greeks, Christians were killed in Kios, especially in Ivalik, Smyrna. Um, you would find you know, this early uh, examples of ethnic cleansing in the Ottoman world uh, at the time. But then the, the, the powers would intervene mainly because of some humanitarian sentiments and also because Russia changed its position and Britain and France didn't want Russia to establish this you know, satellite state in Greece by involving in the, in the revolution unilaterally. And then they intervened, asked the Ottoman Sultan to accept their demands for autonomy for Greece, but the Sultan was so fanatical and so uh, 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 like disappointed with the Greek uprising that he would just categorically reject all great power invitations. So this last part is the problematic part about Ottoman agency, but this is how the narrative has been until today or until I wrote the book possibly, but there were other dynamics at stake, like how the Ottomans read the entire situation as a Russian plot. They, one of the reasons the Ottomans didn't want to be involved in the Vienna order and didn't want to be involved in the final act of the Vienna uh, Congress of Vienna was that they thought that Russians were playing a long game and they expected that it would not end the Russo-Ottoman disputes with 1815 and they didn't really want to you know entrust their empire's future to European public law. They distrusted Europeans and the moment they received the news of a Greek uprising the Sultan and his ministers were persuaded that the Russians had a finger in this, like they were involved in this, though archival evidence suggests that they, they, they didn't in the beginning at least. But there were disputes between Russians and Ottomans in the Balkans and the Caucasus, lingering disputes since 1812, the disputes that the European powers tried to wither away with the final act of the Vienna Congress. 
and the Russians would pressure the Ottomans to come to desk and sign this Ackerman, uh, come to table and sign this Ackerman agreement in 1826. And when that agreement was signed, the Russian agents would pledge the Ottoman plenipotentiaries had it any effect that the moment we resolve the dispute in the Balkans and the Caucasus, the Greek issue will drop out of European agenda. Russia will no longer be involved in it. And Britain and France will eventually just back down because the main reason they were involved was to stop Russians besides humanitarian sentiments. But then one year later in 1827, the Greek issue would not fall from agenda and the powers, including Russia, would once again ask the Ottoman Sultan to give the Greeks autonomy. And the Sultan would remind Russian agents their promises in this, you know, this secret agreement. But the Russians say, would say, well, sorry, the, the Brits, Brit British and the French still want to be involved in this. And it was a no-no for the Ottoman Sultan, Mahmoud II. So there was like the reason they were not even open to negotiating with the powers, the Greek issue, besides, of course, the imperial gaze, they didn't really understand what the Greeks wanted. They didn't really understand this, you know, this liberationist, liberal motifs of the Greeks at all. They considered it as this larger plot, as I said, the Russian plot. But besides that, there were also these diplomatic dimensions. So if you Ask me about the limits of Ottoman agency. First, I would say they couldn't quite read the new Vienna order well until late 1820s, until they lost the war against Russia in 1827, 28, and sorry, yeah, until they signed the Treaty of Edirne, 28, 29 war. Uh, that's one limit. And the second limit of Ottoman agency is the imperial view of revolution or local uprisings was usually shrouded by, by this gaze, the, the failure to see or look what was happening on the ground. They couldn't quite understand what happened in Greece in 1821 till 1832. Uh, they couldn't quite understand what happened in Lebanon, especially in late 1850s, when under Tainus Shai and these Republican egalitarian ideas were more vocally uh, voiced uh, by the Lebanese peasants. They couldn't fathom that either, especially Ottoman Pashas on the edge, uh, on, on the spot like a uh, Hushit Pasha. So I think those were the limits of Ottoman agency. But I hope I understand your question right. You did, thank you. You you did perfectly. Um, well, so I have one more question before we mm. open it up to the audience. And this is something that in a way you deal with, but in a way you don't. And But I could not stop thinking about it both times that I read your book, which is how does your story fit into stories about Tanzimat and the great imperial reorderings of the 19th century? Um, I mean, I was so struck by the list of these violent episodes in the 1820s, the 1830s, the 1850s, the 1860s, across the Balkans and the Arab provinces. And I was wondering to what degree, from an Ottoman perspective, is this about actually implementing Tanzimat in prov these provinces? But it just, it's just struck me. I don't know, I was thinking about how, you know, there's some Ottoman legal historians that argue that the empire was desperate to kind of harmonize its legal and political institutions in the 19th century with Europe in order to do away with the capitulations. Um, but it just strikes me that, of course, your your book happens at, at the precise moment. So how does it how does it fit with Tanzimat? Well, the book, unfortunately, does not cover the Balkans much. Very limited references here and there. And I know you are working on Serbia now, so that might be a disappointment for you. But in my new book that uh, focuses on the 1790s and 1810s, I look at the Serbian uprising and how the Ottomans were responding to it and how the Russians were involved in this as well. So maybe that will satisfy you a bit more of the, the Balkan aspects of, of my narrative, because the new book is, in a way, the prequel to the dangerous kids. But to, to come back to your question about the Tanzimat era, uh, 
uh, from 1830s onward, the focus of the book is mainly on Egypt and Syria. Of course, Egypt has its more autonomous structure, but the, some of the Tanzimat reforms were, of course, introduced there as well, especially the, the economic aspects. But in Syria, and more particularly in Mount Lebanon, I try to give an account of how the Tanzimat was and was not implemented in the mountain and how this uh, half-hearted implementation of Tanzimat reforms affected the, the outbreak of violence and cycle of civil wars in the third part of the book, the, the mountain. So if I may situate the book a bit more in the existing literature, I must be very honest and say that I quite differ with the arguments of Usama Makdisi, for instance. I admire his writing style and the analytical power of his work, but about his take on the impact of the Tanzima as one of the driving forces of sectarian violence of, in Lebanon, I have to disagree with that, and I disagree with him in the book. What I try to show is that we cannot really treat Tanzimat in the first place as a monolithical and homogeneous process. It was discontinuous. And I can't think of a better example than Lebanon. So this the, the period that Makdisi speaks of 1839-40 onward, when the Ottomans restored their rule and started to implement Tanzimat reforms and its arguably egalitarian postulations would confuse Lebanese and contribute to, to, to the sectarian violence eventually. I mean, that's wrong. First of all, because soon after the Ottoman rule is, is, uh, was introduced in, in uh, Lebanon, in April, the Ottoman agents come and they read out the Good Highness script. They say, this is the new order. But then about maybe a week before that, Mustafa Rashid Pasha, the architect of Tanzimat, Rauf Pasha, the Grand Vizier, they fall, they fell from power. And conservative, more conservative, I would say, it would be wrong to say the Ottoman elites were reformists and conservatives. I like to categorize them as conservatives and more conservatives. And uh, this more conservative group led by Izzet Pasha, they came to office in Istanbul and they immediately sent to Syria, to Damascus and Sidon, two extremely conservative Pashas who did nothing but, or who did anything but implement the Tanzimat reforms. So all they did was the exact opposite of what Mustafa Rashid hoped would happen in, 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 in the wider Ottoman Empire. They tried to re-Islamize uh, the, the region. They brought back these Islamic undertones of Ottoman governance, which Tanzimat was trying to tone down. Uh, and Amir Pasha, this interim governor after the, the Grand Emirate in Leb Lebanon was uh, abolished, he would do the exact same thing. The Ottomans even toyed with the idea of making the Druze Sunni so that they would be, you know, um, recruited in the Ottoman Imperial Army. And this continued until 1845. So the period that Maktisi is speaking of in his work I, I can't say that's the Tanzimat era in Syria because it was very selectively in a very limited way the, 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 the Tanzimat system or the new reforms were introduced in Syria and Lebanon to be more precise in that period. But it is true that the European semi-colonial interventions gained traction from that point on. Uh, it was the British and Austrians that managed to drive Mehmet Ali out of Syria, not the Ottoman Navy. In fact, the Ottoman Navy, the fleet that fled to Alexandria after Husserl became Grand Vizier and, you know, the, another complicated story, but, you know, Husserl, the, 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 uh, Daria, the Grand Admiral was an enemy of Husserl, so he sought shelter in the enemy of his enemy, which was Mehmet Ali. So there was no Ottoman Navy in 1839. So they got the support of the British, Austrians, and Prussians to a lesser degree to drive the French, as uh, to drive the French-backed Egyptians out of Syria. So um, 
in that sense, uh, yeah, I, I have to say that we really need to look at who the Ottoman Pashas on the spot were and what their agendas were, what they were trying to do. But there is one thing that is uh, uh, true, that they tried to uh, imp uh, implement a more direct Ottoman role, even the more conservative Pashas. So in that respect, there was a parallel between what Mustafa Rashid wanted to do. But other than that, the introduction of new councils, which you know, happened in Lebanon in 1841 under Richard Wood, which Matisse argues would, you know, this sectarian nature, you know, prompted sectarian uh, cleavages in, in Lebanon. But that had already happened under Egyptian rule a decade ago. And, and in fact, the new conservative push has kind of halted the workings of that council. So uh, the story is a bit more complex. Maybe I shouldn't go into details here. I don't know my audience and how knowledgeable they are about the subject. Uh, so maybe I shouldn't be too boring. But the point that I'm trying to make is Tanzimat was a discontinuous process and Mustafa Rishid's return in 1845, I think we should read implementation of Tanzimat in Lebanon and Syria after Shekip Pasha was sent to region and introduced these new regulations, the organic regulations, if I may translate it into English, I don't know if that makes sense in the English language. Um, and, and from that point on, there is relative success. The, the wings of the federal lords are clipped, but that also results in a new uh, series of violence uprisings on the part of the Rus federal lords who, uh, Fight, fought against these new cadastral mechanisms, these no modern structures of land distribution, and uh, it escalates into a greater, a much greater civil war in 1860. Excellent, thank you. So I guess now we are going to open it up to the audience. Should I give it to you, Mona? Should I give you the... Um, there looks like there's one question from Harris Malonis. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Uh, can you hear me? Good. Yes. So thank you for your um, uh, event and thank you, Ozan, for writing such an interesting book. I haven't read it yet, but uh, it sounds fascinating. Um, I want to ask you, you mentioned earlier uh, in response to one of the questions um, that um, uh, basically you said that one of the limitations of the Ottomans was um, that the, well, the port was not ready to um, understand to go beyond its imperial gaze. You said right, and and look at the Greek War of Independence as a new thing that was kind of unprecedented for what they have been dealing with in the past. So I have two questions related to that. One is um, to what extent what he was observing there was different from what Ali Pasha was doing or what Pashvanoglu was doing earlier. Um, and and whether how they dealt with those movements was any um, you know any um, precedent could be uh, could be uh, tapped into there. Um, and this related question is, they had already dealt with the Orlov rebellion in the 1770s. So. Um, and again, Russia actually Russian backed, unlike the 1821 actually, which wasn't actually initially Russian backed. Uh, so, so I'm wondering to what extent actually that limitation is actually a limitation, given that they do have that you know um, experience. And maybe the limitation actually that I want you to comment on is that the level of external backing was not as strong in all of those other cases I talked about. But, but it was in this one. So that, in a way, it's not a limitation. It was just a literal limitation of a balance of power. That's my question. Yes, I totally agree with you. Thanks for these questions. I think they are both very important. Um, about the oil of rebellion, yes, I think that's, I say exactly that in the book, in fact, like the fact that the Greeks rebelled against the Ottomans and there was some foreign backing was not unprecedented. But what was unprecedented was a collective intervention took place and then it resulted in the partitioning of the Ottoman Empire from an Ottoman perspective. And um, I, I think that's very true. Like we have this new Vienna order and the dynamics of it, the Ottoman agents did not quite see until late 1820s when they uh, made their first 
uh, application, so to speak, to, to join the Consort of Europe, which uh, was turned down. It, as to your question about the Imperial case, I'm not 100% sure I understood you correctly, but what I can tell is about Pasfanolu and Ali Pasha uh, uh, events. They, they did see Ottoman agents, they believed that Ali Pasha was a central figure of the, the, the Greek uprising. The uh, archival documents suggest, and I think this is uh, partially true, Shukri Ilicek is a very interesting discussion of it and a book is coming out soon. And maybe I should uh, not really tell what he's saying in the book. I had the opportunity to read it beforehand. But uh, yes, you're, you're aware of it, yeah? So um, yeah, they, 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 they saw Ali Pasha as this, this central figure within the Greek rebellion. And when he was killed in 1821, he, 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 he uh, 22, yeah, 21, uh, I think the, the the nature of Ottoman perception of Greek rebellion changed to to an extent. But what I meant by imperial gaze was that they were not quite aware of Greek intentions and motivations. They could not really read into the ideological predisposition of Greek revolutionaries. So they saw it more through this religion slash Russian lens. The Ottoman agents, and only after 1832, after Greece became independent, and uh, you know you had these new administrative structures in Serbia, Moldavia, Valachia, and Samos. Only after then you would gradually see a loosening in Ottoman political culture to the extent that in 1837, if I'm not mistaken, Mahmoud II would ask one of his agents to declare or announce publicly how he saw his Jewish, Muslim, and Christian subjects no different from one another. It's something that an Ottoman Sultan wouldn't say earlier. So there is this repositioning, a gradual repositioning. And then you would have the Tanzimat in 1839, where everyone, uh, uh, security, liberty, uh, and property was secured uh, by the empire, uh, but of course uh, uh, there is this discussion now whether the Gulhane Edict was um, speaking of equality or not. There is no the, the term musawat equality is not there. Uh, Etta Meldem uh, wrote this interesting article recently in French. I, I, I'm not sure if you should call it an article because it's about 80 pages. And uh, Alper Antopal also has an interesting discussion of it. Uh, he also argues that there was no Musawat equality wasn't quite in Tanzimat. And I would say yes, in the text of the Tanzimat, it's not quite there, but we might need to read the subtext of the Gulhane edict and how it was diplomatically depicted and how discussions took place diplomatically in diplomatic correspondence where the notion of equality between Muslim and non-Muslim subjects of the Sultan was explicitly stated and then disputed among European and Ottoman agents. So that's something that needs further investigation, I believe, something I didn't do in the book. Um, I, I hope I answered your question, but uh, so that, that, was the, that was the limitation of... of uh, you know, that's what I mean by imperial gaze, the failure to see on the part of imperial agents. Okay, um, are there any other questions from the audience? I see praise, I see praise in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any questions. Um, I can... Um... <laughs> Oh, he, uh, Harris is back asking about the Serbian case. Uh, Which might be a question also for Amy. I think that's, uh, yeah, might possibly be Amy's uh, question, but uh, this, well, the Serbian case is unfortunately not in the book. So uh, maybe I should halt my horses there for now. You have to wait for the invention of the Eastern question before I tell more about the Serbian case. Uh, but what I can tell is, and I think we should be really collaborating more with Amy on this, uh, 
what was happening in the Balkans throughout this period and in the Levant were deeply interlinked. So the one episode that I'm trying to pay more attention to the Balkan politics is the intervention in 1860, while there was an uprising in Bosnia, a simultaneous uprising is happening in Mount Lebanon, and many European agents and Ottoman statesmen are, were persuaded that these uprisings took place simultaneously in Bosnia and Mount Lebanon, not coincidentally. They're, they were Russian and French machinations, especially Karl Marx is writing very strongly about this, like uh, there is this greater game happening there. And a few years earlier, before, before these uprisings took place, the Russian and French agents did indeed flirt with the idea of dismembering the Ottoman Empire as Russian and French and uh, Prussian archival sources suggest, because they also tried to pull the Prussians into this uh, scheme of disintegrating the Ottoman Empire. But in 1859 and 1860, all those schemes disappear all of a sudden. But Ottoman agents, like uh, the Ottoman ministers in Paris, in London, they, they had no doubt that the Russians had a finger in what happened in Bosnia and the French had a finger in, 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 in Mount Lebanon. There are these intelligence reports that some Algerians secretly leaked from Egypt to Damascus to inside rebellion there. So they do see... It, it, these parallels and one one obvious link between the Balkans and the Levants, Lebanon in the 1860s, just before the Lebanese uh, civil war begins and this uh, the mass in uh, violence erupts, uh, the, 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 the violence in uh, the Balkans leads Ottoman Arabistan army of about 10,000 men to be removed from Syria to, and go all the way to the Balkans. So the Ottoman uh, Im imperial uh, Heart power is is uh, absent when when the third Lebanese civil war erupts in 1860. But there is a lot more to say about Serbs in 1800s. But I really like to write the book first, publish it, and then have another book talk, and then explain, if I may, Harris. Okay. Um... I'm sorry, my I just turned off my camera because for some reason I turned green. Uh, so um, I will spare you that. But yes, a big round of applause to both of our guests. Thank you so much for such an interesting conversation. And um, just an announcement that uh, we hope that you'll be able to join us for future events. Um, the next one is actually a Middle East Policy Forum event, which will be a webinar on authoritarianism and law in the Arab world. Um, and that's on Tuesday, next Tuesday at 11. And um, the next in-person event will be protesting Jordan with Jillian Schwidler and Jeremy Crampton um, in conversation. So I will stick in the chat the, um, the link to uh, sign up for our events. And um, Apologies again that I can't see you see your faces, but uh, or show my face to you. But um, I thank you so much for your time and for such an interesting conversation. And we look forward to um, connecting in the future. Thank you.